Today's guest is Christina Mand Lucciani. She's an entrepreneur, an international speaker, and an artist. She's a co-founder of Mind Valley. Uh, you might be familiar with Vision, and she brings her female perspective into the company leadership. She's an advocate for happiness within and also self-love. Um, she's been in the mindset industry for quite a while now, and I love her, um, just her information and her perspectives on happiness. And she just looks at it a little bit differently and also self-love and what that really means, you know? So it's a very wise episode. She's a very wise woman. I think you guys are going to, um, have some moments throughout this interview where you're like, Hmm, you know, it just brings a lot of thought to mind and how we're looking at our lives and what we're prioritizing. So, um, we'll go ahead and jump right in here is Christina Mand. Before we jump into the show, I am extremely honored to share with you the sponsor of this podcast, and that is Rep Provisions. And I want to tell you a little bit about who they are, what they're about. They are a regenerative agriculture company. They are a ranch. I have been to the ranch myself. Incredible. And if you aren't familiar with regenerative agriculture, it is my extreme honor to introduce you. So here's a few statistics of why regenerative agriculture is important before I get into what it is. First of all, the United States is losing topsoil 10 times faster than it's replenishing it right now. And this comes from our modern conventional agriculture practices that we've really just developed in the last several decades. The way we are raising cattle and the way we are growing these monocrops of plants is depleting our topsoil at astronomical rates. And I love the way Eric Perner, the founder uh, and owner of Rep Provisions, the rancher there at the ranch, I love how he puts this. He says that our planet is just a giant rock spinning in space with a tiny layer of topsoil and subsoil that supports all life on the planet. Every economy, every nation is sustained by this layer of topsoil. It's really important, right? We don't have any soil or quality soil, health goes down and then eventually life goes away. Right. So it's, it's so important. Um, right now we're losing about 75 billion tons of topsoil every year, because as it erodes from these conventional farming practices, it goes into the waterways and then goes into the ocean and we lose it. So it's not sustainable, obviously, and we have to regenerate the topsoil. And this is where regenerative agriculture comes in. And the way they raise their animals is supportive of regeneration of the topsoil. So you can listen to my podcast episode with Eric Perner if you want to learn more about exactly how they do it. It's so important. Now, from a health perspective, this is so cool. Um, Eric just shared with me that they had their meat lab tested at Michigan State University. And if you're not familiar with omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, let me share this with you real quick. So omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. They're in all foods. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So this is all foods have a certain ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. Now the ideal is one-to-one, -one, right? So we balance out that pro-inflammatory aspect of food, which is important. It triggers a lot of things in our body, but we balance it with the anti-inflammatory effect. On average, Americans are 10 to one. Their omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is 10 to one because honestly, we eat so much canola oil and so many processed foods and all the way up to 30 to one and higher. It's super inflammatory, causes heart disease, cancer, all disease. Um, grain fed meat is on average five to one ratio or worse. And what came back from Michigan state university is that rep provisions meat has a one to one omega six to omega three ratio, which is freaking huge. Um, so, so cool. I'm so glad they found that out. And by the way, just FYI, grain fed chicken has a 15 to one ratio and seed oils are the worst like canola. Um, so we mean all these industrial seed oils, 70 to one or worse. And they estimate that 25% of the calories in the American diet come from canola oil. No wonder there's so much disease. No wonder everyone's so unhealthy. So just wanted to share that with you guys. This is not only an amazing way to support the planet, but also your own health. Um, and they're giving you guys an awesome discount. It's one of the highest discounts they offer 15% off anything with code coach Tara. So I'll link that in the show notes, or you can go to repprovisions.com anytime and just use the coupon code coach Tara and get 15% off. Okay. So Christine, I was wondering if we could just start off by telling a little bit of your story. You're from Estonia. You know, you've accomplished so much. I'm sure my audience, hopefully you guys are familiar with Mind Valley. I'd be kind of shocked if you weren't, but can you tell us your path of how this all happened? 
<laughs> well, I think the short answer would be by accident. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that answer, actually. You do. That's a great well, answer for us goal setters that were like, we are going to manifest everything exactly like this, you know? So yeah, please elaborate. That's that that was just such a cool uh, thing you said <laughs> i want to manifest things exactly like this but yeah. uh, but that's <laughs> that that's a wealth of of things to talk about just in this one <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh, back to my story so i was born in uh, i i like to start with saying that i was born in a country which does not exist anymore so it's in a way parallel universe or a different planet. Wow. Uh, I was born in Soviet Union, and um, it it is not what Estonia is right now, obviously. Uh, so uh, if I say that I ended up where I ended up by accident, it is absolutely true, because <laughs> in Soviet Union, business uh, was illegal, you would get jailed for, for doing business, wow. and uh, in post-Soviet countries, personal growth is uh, colloquially considered to be for the losers. So neither business wow. nor personal growth or, and transformation were my choice of, uh, of my life path when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a diplomat, in fact. Wow, of course, <laughs> right? Programming. <laughs> well, I, I guess I you want, are in certain ways. <laughs> no, I wanted to be a diplomat because you see, Soviet Union was a, a, a closed country, and I wanted to travel the world, and that uh, probably is the only you. thing which which uh, has always been there. So I, I started my work in government in Estonia, but then I got married and moved to US and uh, accidentally ended up in both in business and personal growth, mostly because I wasn't allowed to work there. So I had nothing better to do but to help wow. my then husband vision to start his business. And that's yeah. that's really absolutely got on a story of how I ended up in Mind Valley. Right. Uh, I did end up from the start. I did uh, do a lot of work in the very beginning. So uh, I... <laughs> I, I am part of the business for a, for the whole period of its uh, existence, okay. um, but uh, of course, with time, um, with time, uh, I grew uh, accustomed to what I was doing, and it became it it did become my path, but it wasn't yeah. a chosen path. Yeah, and uh, to prove the point, I did try to do my own stuff for a while so I went to study again I went to work for NGOs I worked for for actually quite a few uh, other places before before I came back to Mind Valley completely so yes it was a winding path but it yeah. brought me here to your podcast <laughs> yes well thank you so much and I love that I you know I think um all of us can relate especially if you've kind of been on, I call it the magical carpet ride of life. When you start like really stepping into who you really are and removing this old paradigm, this ego structure you've built up and, you know, and you're, you're, you're in tune and you're in alignment. It, it and maybe even sometimes when you're not in tune and in alignment, but you, it's just beautiful how the universe just like pulls in these little pieces in our path, these messengers, these events that change the course of everything and, and, and bring us into this place where we're like completely aligned with our truth. And I mean, I love that you're preaching messages about happiness. Um, this is, um, I think right now in the world, we're seeing a little bit of a shift in personal growth, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I love a lot of what Gary Vee has to say, and I don't mean to like put him <laughs> down or anything like that, but he, he's kind of like a good example of like how personal growth has been like the last, you know, maybe five to 10 years of this, like I sleep when I'm dead and I grind and like, this is all that matters. You know what I mean? And, and that was very popular, right? Like that was the comment. still is. It still, it still is in a lot of ways, but there is a shift I see happening. Um, and it's kind of where spirituality comes in, I think in entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and personal growth a little bit. And it's like, actually, I don't know about that. You know, like how about, all, isn't being happy important as well? So I'll let you take <laughs> it from there is happy. You know, where does happiness come well, into a personal growth path? Uh, so, uh, to talk about Gary Vee, I actually don't consider him uh, purely personal growth. He is, um, uh, yeah. kind of, of an old school of, uh, of, extra education after your formal uh, academic education yeah but you know uh, the whole uh, because I've been in personal growth for 18 years so I've seen it um, through through years yeah. uh, and and it has started with uh, well it, it has started a long time ago you can actually probably take the first philosophers stoicism <laughs> is coming back after all but uh, more more traditionally the way we are we see it right now it probably started in the beginning of the 20th century with Napoleon Hill and uh, yeah I don't remember the name of, but uh, it, it has evolved. So the, right. I think the 20th century personal growth is uh, going beyond 
uh, beyond just productivity and success and high achievement, which was definitely the theme of the end of the 20th century. But then society, humankind has always gone through waves. There is this interesting um, researcher, I think his name is Alfie Kohn, and he talks about that so beautifully that we we get fascinated by certain ideas and the society starts to talk about that. uh, And then we almost, it's like a pendulum. We almost exaggerate it. Right. And then it is going to swing back. So uh, Gary Vee is definitely one of the examples of the extreme of that old school personal growth of the 20th century. But we have crossed over the 21st century and we are seeing that it is, uh, you know, it is not uh, working out for a lot of people. It yeah. does work out for a few and for them, I'm very happy because you're in the right place. In the right yeah. Time. If, it, if that's your, like your vibe that you want in life, like go by all means, go ahead, you know, but there's a, it doesn't work for everyone. I'll put it that way. <laughs> but coming back to happiness, you know, yeah. um, I want to, I, I'll first ask the question and I'm not asking you specifically because I'm, I'm not a coach. I, I'm not in the habit of asking my host questions, <laughs> but I'm asking the audience and the people who are listening, how important is happiness to you? If you were to actually, it's not a rhetorical question. If you were actually to slow down and ask yourself, is it important? And I bet, and I've been, uh, because one part of my life is personal growth and transformation. The other part is actually business because despite my fluffy uh, outside, (laughs) I'm a little bit of a shark inside as well. (laughs) So I've been in both both roles. uh, And I, uh, I can guarantee that most people, actually do not have happiness, most grown-up people, do not have happiness among their, uh, let's say, goals for the year 2021. Yeah. If you look back to, and, and I believe that your, your peeps actually do write down their goals every year or maybe every month. Yeah. If you look down at your latest version of goals, I bet you don't have, I want to be happy there. Yet, if I were to ask you, what would you like or what would you wish for the person that you love the most? And I don't know exactly who that person is for you but I I assume for a lot of people who have families it would be a child a a child that we love a lot if you would imagine a child what do you want for them you want them to be happy we actually wish each other happiness for birthdays for anything happy anniversary happy birthday be happy this is something which is so overused in one side and undervalued on the other side yeah and there's this huge conflict actually is it important or is it not and that's the question that everybody has to answer for themselves. Is it important? Is it not? So if I were to refer to what the society, contemporary society thinks about happiness, because I've been researching happiness for quite a few years, and I'm not the type of researcher who actually conducts the academic research. I don't interview people, but I do research other people's research and other people's yeah. works and, and uh, you know, speeches, books, everything. And I tell you that contemporary uh, idea about happiness is that it is not important, that you cannot be pursuing it. It's actually not such a new, a new idea. The, the idea that if you go for happiness, you're not going to get it is actually really old. So people, uh, we, we keep being told, don't go for happiness. It's unimportant. Success is important. Meaning is important. Doing good for other people is important. Altruism is important. Everything is important except happiness. That's the general idea currently, contemporary, Mm -hmm. 2021. And, um, you know, the thing is that, um, you see, in personal growth, there is one interesting thing, and you would know that. If you want anything, you have to work on it. If you want a healthy body, you have to work on your body. You have to go to the gym, you have to learn nutrition, you have to take care of that. If you want good relationships, you have to work on them. If you want a business, you have to work on it. Well, Gary Vee would tell you that. Mm -hmm. All yes, night long. <laughs> if you want to be happy, yeah, it just happens, right? <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> well, you know what's interesting? I love this conversation because um, I, I I lean into intuition a lot and meditate. And I was, you know, one day I was uh, just meditating on on what my clients want when they come to me for health and mindset coaching. Right? I'm like, if I as I, I sat there in silence, what came in was what they all want is happiness. And they perceive that the thing that they think they want, the only reason they think they want that is they 
perceive that it's going to bring them happiness. So this woman perceives that getting really lean and strong is going to bring her happiness. This woman perceives that having a better relationship with food is going to bring her happiness. This guy believes that having bigger pecs is going to bring him happiness. But at the end of the day, all the other goals there, they all lead to this perception of the happiness that we think that we're going to bring. So it's funny mm-hmm. because I see this huge disconnect, right? Like we don't, nobody says like, I want to, I just want to be happy. I'm at my <laughs> biggest goal in 2022 is happiness. No one says that. Um, but what we don't realize is that we're chasing it constantly through all of these things. Even if you look at like caffeine, it makes me happy. Uh, working out makes me happy. That Netflix show makes me happy. Like we're chasing it like crazy, but we don't even realize it. (laughs) This is absolutely true. Yes, we, we are subconsciously. The thing is that, you know, the human nature is so stubborn, we think that we uh, we study, we enlighten ourselves, and then we'll go against the human nature. No, it yeah. doesn't work like that. Yeah. It will still run you. You are just, I, there, there are two ways. It will either run you and you won't even notice, so you will keep struggling with it. <laughs> but back yeah. to happiness, you know, it's interesting because uh, there is research, not one, actually a few, which try to see the correlation between happiness and success. And if yeah. I, I were to say that success is not going to bring you happiness, you would probably agree with me because we know a lot of people who are successful, but grumpy and unhappy. And yeah. after all, we know a lot of really accomplished uh, celebrities who have taken their life. Right. And that's the uh, extreme opposite of being happy. Right. Uh, so success, obviously we kind of know that success doesn't bring us happiness yet. If you look at people's goals, they go for success, not for happiness, right? Right. Isn't that interesting? Uh, So research shows, and I have to look into which research exactly, which paper exactly it was, that um, there is, so your level of success is not a predictor of how how happy you're going to to be. You don't need to research that, but the level of your happiness is uh, is a predictor of how luck, uh, how likely you are to be successful. So the the more happy you are, the more likely you are to actually achieve your goals and be successful. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I remember reading The Happiness Advantage by Sean Acor, where that you know it completely flipped my paradigm because I was in that that Gary V. You know, I was going to bed at midnight, getting up at four, and I'm like, this is the price of success. You know, you got to pay your dues, you got to put the work in. I'm working when everyone else is sleeping, kind of mentality, right? <laughs> And I, you know, I was saying no to all these social opportunities. I'm like, no, I got to freaking work. I get my stuff done. I'm building an empire. You know, I was in this like crazy, um, very, I would say immature it, to me, as I look back on that, it feels like an immature energy. And I read Sean Aker's book about happiness and, mm. and how much it actually improves success and how much it actually improves productivity. Yeah. And it really, really, it was, has been a life-changing experience for me. Um, because as I, you know, I'm, I am a goal setter. I love, I love it. I've always been that way. Like since kindergarten, I couldn't wait to have homework. I was like, yeah, you know, anything I could do to, to <laughs> achieve is just, I'm wired that way. Um, what I have found though, is, um, happiness for me has become a, uh, a barometer of how out of alignment I am or not. So if I, if I'm starting to just feel stressed and miserable, I'm like, oh, something's completely wrong, you know? And then, yeah. Can I comment on that? Because I think we often think that there is a choice, either you're happy or you're successful, right? Either you do (laughs) something or you actually have your life uh, in one piece. And I like to comment, uh, to, 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 uh, sorry, quote, um, Harvecker here. He says, although I'll adjust his quote to to this exact uh, situation, what is more important, happiness or success? How about both? Yeah, love it. What is more important, leg or arm? How about both? (laughs) <laughs> and it is so yeah. interesting that we we don't even think about like why why do we always have to polarize things? Yeah. I'm a, I'm either a very successful high achiever or I enjoy my life. How about you actually do both? So I right. I'm happy for for Gary Vee because I believe this is what makes him happy and totally this is personal brand of happiness. I would never yes. suggest he does anything else. But what I would suggest to people who listen to him that they ask if that what is going to make you happy. Beautiful. Because what is going to make me happy is very different from what is going to make you happy. Right. And uh, I think I I beat him by the way. <laughs> He uh, he has uh, given up life for the sake of work. I actually believe that. Uh, so I've, I've created a t- job title for myself. I'm an everyday life philosopher. 
So whatever I'm going through in life is actually contributing to my work. It's my research. Right. It's my material right. for writing. It's my material for speeches. Yeah. So if I wake up in the morning in the bad mood and I'm going through a bout of depression, right. I take this time off because this is my work. I'm doing yeah. research. Yeah, so. it's, it, it, I feel that way too as a health and mindset coach. It's a wonderful way to live. You're learning constantly. You know, there's like, you can't lose. But yes, you're, you're basically saying you are, even when you're sleeping, you're working because you're probably learning about how your subconscious mind is getting reprogrammed during your sleep. You know, sleep. it's just, I, 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 am do, I do joke a little bit. It's not, a, it's not said 100% seriously, but I have a theory and um, I, I want to share it because uh, we are sometimes forgetting the uh, Pareto law, which exact, uh, I'm actually, again, uh, using a little bit loosely in this context, that 20% of your uh, activities are going to bring 80% of your results. Although Par Pareto did um, uh, imply slightly different circumstances, but it is actually a very significant rule which works in so many areas. 20% of, uh, of uh, your effort or resource that you put in brings in 80% of your results. So I have a theory, I call it surface and hustlers for no surprise. So we all know what hustlers are. Mm -hmm. And hustling essentially works uh, on the concept of, um, of resistance. You, uh, because hustling, uh, you, you don't feel that you hustle unless you put, uh, unless you have some resistance. You have to yeah. put sweat, blood, tears, sleep right. at night. If you don't, something is fishy. We do have this interesting belief in our head that if success comes easily, then it's uh, it's strange, it's weird, right? Because we are told yeah. success doesn't come easy, success doesn't come overnight. So God forbid it comes easy or overnight. Yeah. We start sabotaging ourselves. We start uh, doubting. That's where imposter syndrome comes in. But I never did anything. How, how am I successful? So what we do subconsciously, because we all want to deserve our success, to actually know that, okay, I, I earned it. We subconsciously put resistance in our way because wow. otherwise, otherwise we don't feel that we deserve uh, success. Wow. So it works. Uh, an analogy would be going to the gym. When you go to the gym and you work on the machines, and if you leave the gym and your muscles don't hurt, you think that you haven't done enough work or you have done it wrong because your muscles didn't, uh, whatever, tear and they don't uh, don't don't hurt. So you're not going to get results. So what do you do? You add weights to your machines. So that when you get out of the gym, you feel the burn. So it is exactly the same thing. There is even, uh, even this new school of uh, conscious procrastinating, although I don't remember the actual name of it. It's something like, uh, you know, when you procrastinate to create stress, because you think that you work, you, you function more um, better, more efficiently under stress. But just, just to, under, to make you understand that idea that you function better under stress came from research which was done in the beginning of the 20th century. I think it was, uh, God, they have such complicated names, uh, Dawson and Jerk, something like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they did this research on mice. Oh, if wow. You, if you, uh, if you expose mice to uh, a little bit of uh, electric shock, they tend to find the escape faster. And we have taken that research and wow. applied it to our lives. So, okay, I don't mind people working, uh, pushing, liking a little bit of stress. I wrote my two uh, diplomas in university also in the last week overnight, not <laughs> sleeping the last few nights. I, mm -hmm. I get it. We mm -hmm. all do that for different reasons. And I don't yeah. want to go into procrastination. But the thing is that if you believe Mm. that you require stress and resistance to deserve your success, you're going to create it subconsciously. Mm. And more than that, your life is going to be the proof of what you believe because we, that's how beliefs work. You believe in something and you see, you see evidence of that. So you mm. will create evidence of that belief being true. Mm. That's why a lot of my high achieving successful friends, they feel guilty when they get a free time. They feel that they need to fill every single moment of life. They actually feel uneasy. They can't yeah. take a break and can't take, uh, they, they can't take a break, not because they can't afford. They yeah. can't afford time-wise. They can't afford emotionally. They don't believe. The, the, the moment they are resting, they feel that they are losing time, losing opportunities, and their success is sleeping through the fingers. Yeah. And the worst thing is that if you believe something, you're going to prove it to yourself subconsciously. Yeah. So I have a theory of hustling and surfing. So this is hustling. This is a regime which we all know and understand because our society 
uh, glorifies that regime. I heard somewhere this interesting idea that burnout is a badge of honor in the 21st century. People feel proud. I remember when I moved to New York, I was shocked when people with pride said, I work 24 seven. I have 80 hour work weeks. For God's sake, really? Yeah. And they wear it as a badge of honor. You feel right. guilty. You feel ashamed if you don't work 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week. You feel ashamed. All right. And you feel you're not deserving success. So the, the antidote to that is uh, surfing. And it is exactly how it, uh, it sounds. Surfers are the little dots in the ocean and they're waiting for the wave. And when the wave come, they jump on the board and they make it to the shore with speed and joy and fun. Yeah. So there is this regime as well. And in, especially if you are in creative tasks, in creative work, whether you are a designer, writer, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship is a creative work. Yeah. You need surfing. Yeah. Because creation doesn't happen in a, uh, in a hamster's wheel. Right. So just to finish this up, you know, it's not that hustling is bad, surfing is good, or you have to do one or the other. How about both? Mm. You actually need both regimes from time to time, depends on, you know, depends on the circumstances. I, I go into the hamster's wheel from time to time. I enjoy it from time to time. My today mm. was the hamster's wheel and I enjoyed it because tomorrow I'm going for a one week long holiday. Mm. But yeah. if, if hustling becomes your default regime and you feel something is wrong when you're not hustling, it's a huge red flag. Something is off. Yeah. I love what you're saying about your, if you have that belief in your subconscious, you're going to prove it to yourself. And, and it's so true. And I also love as a personal trainer, I love that you use the muscle analogy, building muscle. Cause I have observed this. I realized that actually, if you're somebody who has like built a lot of muscle on your body, you know, a bodybuilder, you're really into that. I have learned that you are going to have to unlearn the principles that got you that success when it comes to like entrepreneurial and business success. Now, yes, through a lot of hard work and con because it, the, the, what you learn in the gym is I have to, it, it has to be hard. I actually have to make it harder than what my brain wants my body to do. Cause your brain will actually try to bypass a lot of these muscles, yeah. right? It's not efficient. Your brain doesn't want to do that. It's like, Oh, just do this. It's easier. Right. So you actually have to train your mind to make it harder. So what happens when you get into the rest of your life? It's like, Oh, I got success by literally choosing to make things harder in my life. So yeah. let me go do that in business. And sure. Yeah. You could build, like I had to learn real quickly. I'm like, that's exactly what I'm doing. Exactly what you're talking about. And, um, you know, I'll just add real quick, your surfer analogy. I love so much. I love birds. I, I <laughs> eat the Eagle is my, my spirit animal. And I have observed the large birds, right? These birds are like the top of the food chain in the bird kingdom. And these birds, they soar, they put, the, they catch the wind and they make it easy. Yeah. And the little birds, the little teeny ones, they are flapping, 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 but they're working so hard, you know? And so it's just this beautiful analogy. You know, I look at that and I'm just like, I want to be like those ones. I want to catch the wind and freaking ride it, not sit here and just flap all day long and not really get anywhere. <laughs> all right. So can we shift into uh, self-love? I know you talk about self-love a lot. You know, what are your thoughts in regards to the like, people hear self-love and they're like, yeah, 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 I love myself, <laughs> right? I feel like this is, you know, but what, what interesting insights do you have in regards to self-love for my audience? <laughs> you know, all these topics are worthy of a, a really long discussion, but yeah. I will ask you this. No, I, you know, I'll start with a quote. I love this quote. It's uh, Oscar Wilde. He said, love for yourself is the beginning of a lifelong romance. Love and that. I think it's very significant. I, I know Oscar Wilde always makes jokes. It's, it's not a serious quote, but it has a very deep meaning because it's a uh, it's a beginning of a lifelong romance. So if I were to ask you, what's your relationship status with yourself? Is it, uh, is it you know, happy, happily married or is it it's complicated? <laughs> yeah. Or is it I'm single? I do not know who I am, actually. Right, right. You know, what's your relationship status? So we could go uh, into self-love and approach it from so many different angles, but I somehow feel, it's it's my hunch, that maybe uh, we could talk about uh, the difference between self-love and self-care. Because I think uh, uh -huh. there is... Uh, especially in my niche, personal growth and transformation, there's a lot of confusion between self-love and self-care. Mm. And uh, I think it is an important thing. And I'll bring an analogy because analogies are so much easier to understand. When yeah. a child is born, uh, a baby is born. Uh, a baby, I'm going to call it a, a baby, a her, she. 
because I'm a feminist. <laughs> so when the baby is born, uh, she needs to be taken care of, otherwise she'll die. So she needs to be fed, she needs to be clothed and washed and walked and whatnot and put to sleep and soothed. Uh, and that is care, that's maintenance work which can be done by parents and often is done by parents, but it can be done, done by nurses, doctors, caretakers, teachers, anyone. You, anybody would understand, it's, it's common sense, that for a child to grow up into a happy, fulfilled, you know, uh, a child who's out there doing things in the world, the child will need love, parental love, something which is not care. That's why you would see examples of children who have all the care in the world, all the, you know, all the earthly um, physical world goods, unless they actually have that relationship with someone, mm -hmm. they're never going to grow up into uh, healthy, fulfilled, happy human beings, just because this is our human need to have connection, to have, uh, well, to know that we are loved, that we are worthy of yeah. love from a very early age. Yeah. And from the very, very early age, we learn that are we worthy of love or not? Why are we worthy of love? And we carry that, uh, that blueprint into our life, into our grown up mm -hmm. life. So why do I bring this analogy is that I believe that uh, a human being needs to learn to love himself or herself, the way we love our children unconditionally, yeah. unconditionally and, and not making it into a bargain. Yeah. Uh, you can't, you like, if you understand child psychology or like child parent relationships, you will know simple rules. Uh, love should be given unconditionally for no reason. It shouldn't be bargained for. It yeah. shouldn't be, uh, uh, you, you know, it shouldn't be a negotiation. Oh, you, you do your bed, you study well, and uh, you're a good boy and mommy's going to right. love you. It doesn't right. work like that. Yet we do that to ourselves. Yep. We somehow, because I've talked about self-love for such a long time. And why did I mention self-care is that I, I talk about relationship. Care, maintenance is something completely different. I call it skin deep. It's ritualistic. It's skin deep. It usually requires some mm -hmm. time, uh, but it's, it's, it doesn't affect your relationship. Right. Uh, going for a massage is self-care. Having a meditation is self-care. It's not mm -hmm. actually about self-love. It's, it's maintenance work. And often the same way we do with children, sometimes busy parents, if we don't have time for a uh, proper relationship, for connection, to be present, what do we do? We compensate with care. Yes. A gift. Yep. yep. A treat. And yep. we do that to ourselves as well. And it is important yep. to understand the difference between self-care and self-love because self-care is negotiable. You... You know, I would say self-love is primary self-care. Self-love will be, be self-care anytime. Yeah, yeah. If you think that your body is your temple, it's your right and you should take care of it. But if you, uh, if you fail, if you go out and party and drink an extra glass of wine, right. are you going to beat yourself up the next morning? Yeah. I tell you that that extra glass of wine does way less damage to your body then you beating yourself up does to your soul. hundred percent. I, I love this analogy so much because I, I love that you're using parenting. Um, I, I see this a lot. Um, and I, I, I was guilty of it for a long time, uh, the overcompensating thing. Right. And so I would be like, I took you guys, I have four kids. Okay. I took you guys to the park and then we went and got lunch and we went and saw a movie and like, you guys are fighting, you know, it's this energy, like, and it, it, it does nothing to really build a relationship. Sure. It was like fun. But if, if during our, my time at the park, I'm yelling at them because they're not doing everything perfectly <laughs> just as they should, or at <laughs> lunch, I'm getting on them because they're not having manners and yelling at everyone. Like I learned the, the, the example I, I share a lot is the best thing I have ever done to build my relationship with my kids is to just sit on the couch with nothing in my hands, completely available to them and just admire their beauty, whatever, because they will come like magnets and they will start showing me things and telling me things and doing funny things. And, and if, if, if I just sit there and just smile and love them and, and, and hold this mirror of like, I see your beauty, you're a beautiful person. You're an intelligent person. I see you. That is the most building thing that I've ever done with my kids. And I love that analogy because it's, you know, exactly. I, I, I've walked the path you're talking about and I can't emphasize enough. I have been there. I have been in the conditional love with myself, right? If you 
if you look like this, if you, you know, have this house, if you, you know, then you're good enough, but right now you're not, you know, that's a, it's such exactly. a horrible relationship and man, it's uh it's so beautiful when you, when you're filled with compassion and you just truly like, I guess like reintegrate with your child self. That's how I feel. Like, I love her. I know her. I am her. Hi everyone. This is five-year-old <laughs> Tara speaking. I just got a bigger body now, you know, like that's how I feel. And it's, it's so beautiful. So thank you for sharing that. And especially that about I think a, a lack of self-love gets masked under self-care sometimes, right? Like we see this in uh, the bodybuilding industry. Sorry to shout you guys out, but you know, it's freaking true. You see this, I see this a lot where it's like, I take care of myself, but it's, it's not based in love. It's based in not enoughness, you know, because if you don't meet that standard, what's happening emotionally inside of you, there's your answer. If you're having experiencing self-love or not. That's, that's why I think it's incredibly important to understand the difference between self-care and self-love. Yes. I love that. It's point. so easy to escape into, but I meditate. I do yoga. Right. I sleep properly. Of course I love myself. No, you take a good care of yourself. Think of those, those really cute, clean, disciplined kids who feel lonely Right. Because self-love right. is relationship. That's why I quoted Oscar Wilde. It is a relationship. It's not about self-care. It's yeah. about relationship. And often, and self-care is important, but you don't, you don't charge your phone out of love for the piece of machinery that it is, <laughs> right? You charge it because it won't work if you don't. And that's the same with self-care. You don't do it out of love for yourself. You do it because you won't function if you don't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is important. It is important, but yeah. it doesn't replace self-love. Yeah. I... And that's the thing. We, we misunderstand self-love. I, why, do, why I bring mm -hmm. an analogy with kids is because this is the closest a human being, uh, a regular human being, can get <laughs> to understanding unconditional selfless right. your love. Right. Yeah. Which is not a bargain. Mm -hmm. uh, because I can, uh, my, my son has Asperger's. I can never think, oh my God, I'd love him even more if he didn't have it. No, <laughs> never. I love him yeah. with it. Yeah. Not despite it. Right. With it. Right. So, but we don't love ourselves with everything that we are. Right. And we yeah. think, I've heard, because I talk about self love so much, I've heard comments, for example, that the biggest fear is why are people too afraid of loving themselves? They think there is such a thing as too much self love. Too much <laughs> self love. They think that uh, selfishness is an extreme expression of self love. Complacency is an extreme expression of self-love. Wow. I'm, I'm, I love myself as I am. I'm too good. I don't need yes. to Yes. There's a fear there for sure. And they also, they also think that, you know, uh, if, if, if you love yourself, so it's part of the complacency also, but that if you love yourself too much, you're not going to grow and evolve. Right. Yep. People are afraid of that. They really think, oh, mm -hmm. or like, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll indulge in things because, you know, I love myself. The, the, the thing we have to understand that neither uh, ex excessive obsessive self-care, nor indulgence, nor selfishness, nor uh, complacency, they're not expressions of self-love. No, they're, they're not, not the extreme of self-love. Yeah. They're the misrepresentation, misunderstanding of self-love. They're compensation. of self-love. A hundred percent. Occasionally, it's a compensation. So a very easy uh, analogy would be, I don't have a glass, unfortunately. I came without a water today. But let's say if you're a vessel, um, and love is water, fill the vessel. So if you have, if your glass is full with love, with self-love, you can't pour any more on top of it because you're full to the brim. Mm -hmm. You can only pour love on top of what you have or inside your glass if it is empty. So selfishness, it's when you expect love from outside because you can't give it to yourself. It's because you, you know, you need love, admiration, validation, somebody right. to treat you properly because right. you don't give it to yourself. Right. That's why you can pour into your glass. Mm. But if you have it, if you have your glass full to the brim, you're not going to get, you're not going to get enough space to get love from outside. You'll give love to the outside. Right. When it comes to complacency, it's slightly different logic, but, um, you know, we have this one teacher, she's, uh, she, she's really amazing and a, a good friend, uh, Marissa Pierce. So she, her, her main message is that you are enough. And she was recording a program with us with Vine Valley. And one of our videographers asked her in, between the shoot, he said, you know, but if I think that I'm enough and I uh, stay at home, lying on my couch saying to myself, I'm enough, am I not going to stagnate? 
<laughs> and Marissa's answer, of course, loosely interpreted by me was, you know, you stay on the couch and don't go out and say you're enough, not because you're enough or you believe in yourself, but from the opposite. It is because you don't think you're good enough to go out and challenge yourself. Right. From fear. Oh, yes. Exactly. You go out and you challenge yourself because you believe in yourself, because you know that you're good enough. That's yeah, where you get the courage. Thank you for sharing that. I, it's, I, 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 I challenge my clients sometimes with this, right? Because they are used to using um, not enoughness as a driver. And so they, there is this fear. I'm going to end up this 500 pound loser watching TV all day with Dorito crumbs all over my shirt. If I tell myself <laughs> I'm enough, right? Like, there's like a, an immense amount of fear there. And I, it, 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 that's what I tell them. Like when you know that you are so powerful and, and it, it, it drives you thousand times higher than any sort of not enoughness ever will, because you will always end up sabotaging yourself because deep down inside, you don't believe you are enough, right? So you might be faking it and faking it, faking it. But at the end of the day, you're not going to get as high as you could be. And when you are like, of course, like enough, you know, like what you get to a certain point where you're like, enough, enough is like an insult. I'm like I'm more than enough. I'm like <laughs> a divine freaking expression of divinity and source power and a light that's just shining. You know what I mean? It's like enough. Well, it's like, duh, you know? And like, when you get to that energy, watch out world, you know, cause now you're just like, you're just shining, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I appreciate that message so much. Um, all right. So in terms, of, I know we have like we was a little bit longer. And I asked you before we got started, uh, could you share a little bit, you, you know, we, we heard you talk about your business shark that's inside this adorable guys. If you aren't watching, watching on YouTube, she's adorable. So <laughs> let's, I'm curious, you know, I saw on your, I saw on your website that you have a, a presentation on business mistakes. And I was just wondering, you know, especially for my women out there, but I'm no guys mm-hmm. will be interested in this too, but could you share briefly, you know, some of the lessons that you've learned that you might be in, um, that you might think is insightful for my audience that is pretty much, you know, not everybody, but a lot of you guys are on that entrepreneurial path. And I would just love to hear some of your wisdom you've learned over the last 15 to 20 years in this industry. Oh God, that would be a long, long session. I believe (laughs) maybe one, maybe one, (laughs) one thing, you know, (laughs) let's say, okay, let's put it this way. I, I, I know a lot of people that follow me on social media or maybe listen to this podcast, um, are they're in this space where they have a dream. And they, they have this vision and they want to go for it and they want to help people and they want to serve. And they're like, I have no idea where to freaking start. I don't even know. Like, I don't even know if I can do it. Um, I don't know if if are people going to judge me and think I'm like, think I'm the crap because I am now going to be a health coach or, you know, mindset coach or, you know, these kind of things, or they want to start a new business. You know, what is, what piece of advice would you have for somebody who's starting out on the entrepreneurial path, you know, any wisdom to share? There are two things I could comment, uh, well, out of many. Uh, one of them is, why would you even care what other people think? <laughs> <laughs> Boom. But, Amen. <laughs> but that, but that's, that's a deep, deep conversation. And here yeah. I would answer probably, you know, your relationship with the world starts with your relationship with yourself. Usually if you care what pe- other people think, it's because you care about your own judgment. Yes. You're your first critic. So the world is not going to trigger if you figure out your relationship with self. If you can be kind to yourself, you'll be kind to the world. Beautiful. If you can be tolerating of your quirks, you'll be tolerating of the quirks of the world. If you can be forgiving for, towards yourself, you'll be forgiving of the world. So usually, if you're worried about whatever world is thinking about you, or if it triggers you, or if you're upset regularly, my, my suggestion, and I know I'm, I'm just scratching the surface, you have to go deep to understand the concept why I'm saying that, but just mm-hmm. believe me, Mm -hmm. turn to yourself and ask what is it that triggers me why Mm -hmm. am I triggered by that what does it say about me about my values about my relationship to myself and out of 18 years of uh, working in personal growth and transformation what I've learned is that you know once you figure out your relationship with yourself your relationship with the world will fall into place and then the question how the world is going to take you is not so important Of course, there is moral code and there are values and you wouldn't do things to other people, not because you're afraid of how they will think about you, but because it's, it's not maybe congruent with your values. So it doesn't, I'm I'm not a moral relativist, not at all, but you shouldn't really care about what the world thinks. I love that answer. This is one answer. The (laughs) second answer 
is a little bit different. So I was born in Soviet Union and I was 14 when it collapsed. And a lot of wow. people had to reinvent themselves from scratch because it just was it was a different planet. Someday I'm going to write wow. a book about that. Yeah. Just for you guys to understand, it's well, it's actually maybe comparable to uh, North Korea in in the um in the degree of how insanely different it was. Wow. And then I spent 16 years in uh, in Asia, in Malaysia. Uh, it's Southeast Asia. Malaysia is a fairly civilized place, or at least you can live in your bubble of civilization and not see the reality. But I've lived in uh, countries which are, strictly speaking, not fully developed. <laughs> not even strictly speaking. <laughs> and I can tell you this one thing. If you're listening to this, not from one of the developing world countries, not from one of the countries which is not uh, economically very rich, then most likely you're safe. And often, you know, when we don't, when we don't give up the job that we are afraid, uh, that we don't like, when we don't go into business, when we don't do things that we love, it's not because we don't know if, you know, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I have the makings, I don't know if I have the money to invest or time to find. It's not because of that. We're just afraid of failure. We have, we are worried. And that's what our brain does. Our brain's mm -hmm. function is to warn us against danger, but we don't face lions and tigers anymore. So obviously we exaggerate the dangers that we have, but I can tell you mm -hmm. that we are afraid of things which are not dangerous to us, such as public speaking and starting a business. And we are absolutely unafraid of things which are much more risky, such as heart attack and commute. Isn't that ridiculous, right? So right. what I'm trying to say is that if you are not starting what you love to do, then it's all, all your reasons are probably a bunch of fluff. <laughs> it's just a masquerade to, to not confess to yourself that you are plainly scared. Yeah. But I tell you this thing, you have nothing to be afraid of. In the civilized world, I'm not sure America is a little bit different from Europe. You don't have such strong social support by the state. But even that aside, you have charities, you have friends, you have families. The worst case scenario that can happen to you, if you're lucky enough to have your parents, is uh, you come back to your mom and say, mom, can I live with you for a while? Yeah. Well, get my shit together yeah. and find that job again. If you think the job is a safe thing, no. Those who worked in the uh, in the tourism uh, industry two years ago discovered that even secure jobs are not secure. Nothing is secure in this world. Mm -hmm. It's just that in some areas, the risk is masked and you don't see it. And yeah. so you don't have the responsibility. But the risk is there. Whether you are working for someone or you're working for yourself, there's always risk. But when you work for someone else, your, response, uh, your life is not in your hands. Right. And when you work for yourself, yes, there's the same risk, but you're also responsible for it. Love it. That's the only difference. Mm. And what I wanted to say is that you have nothing to be afraid of, really nothing. As long as you have yourself, your health, your body, and your clear mind and conscious, be fine. You'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Oh, I love such wise words. Thank you for sharing that. And I love what you're saying about judgments, uh, what, what other people think. Be It's really just a projection of of your own judgments on yourself and you're projecting on others that they're doing that to you and you're, and you're judging others because you treat yourself like that. Right. So it's this false reality that we live in. And it's true. I can't, I can't tell you how many uh, relationships I've seen transformed in my clients by them just changing their own self-talk, their own relationship with self. And then all of a sudden their partner is like, wow, they're actually really great. It's like, Oh, I wonder how that <laughs> happened. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I love that answer so much. And yeah, I, you know, for me, when I started my business, I had $17 to my name. I didn't have parents that could help me or who I could live with, um, or any family or friends. I had nothing. I had nothing. And I like, to me, I'm grateful for that. And I, I actually find this amongst, um, people who have come from other countries, maybe where they didn't have as much opportunity or perceived safety at, that we have in the U S because it's, it, it drives you to realize like, there's an alternative here in which I actually don't have that opportunity. And like, we have, you have the opportunity to freaking just go and create something. Yes. Yay. You know? And so I actually really, really appreciate that about like my European or, you know, foreign friends. Cause they have, they have just this drive where they appreciate the opportunity to even freaking try. 
you know, and I think when we look at it that way, it's like, what do you really, what do you have to lose? Come on now. You can just go work at target or something. If it doesn't work out, <laughs> you can go back to that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Wow. Okay. So guys, if you want to find Christina, um, you guys can go to her website. We'll link it in the show notes. What's your social media. What, what's the best social media to find you on? I'm uh, usually on Instagram. <laughs> that, okay. That's where I'm personally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's Christina Mann, but I have a very funny way of writing my name because I'm from Estonia. So it's Christina with a K and M-A-N-D is the family name. Mann. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, guys, we'll link up all the social medias and your website and, and programs and courses and all of the things on the show notes. And again, you guys, you can watch this on YouTube or listen on all audio platforms. Christina, thank you so much. Thank it's been so, so awesome to hear from you today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm.